And walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you had never failed me yet And waiting for change to come And knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet His promise still stands. Let's sing that this morning. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your. And Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love My heart will sing your praise again Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness
You know, Paul says in Romans 8 that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor things past, nor things present, nothing in all of creation will ever separate you from the love you have in Christ Jesus. And the most amazing thing about our God is he can't love you any more than he does right now. And his love is constant and it is sure. And so we can go and know that we have a faithful God, a righteous God, a holy God, but a God who loves us infinitely more than we could ever hope or imagine. So let's go before that throne this morning. Father God, we thank you, God, that your love is the one constant in our life. It's the one thing that never changes, Father. It doesn't matter where we go in this life, Father, your love pursues us with an everlasting love. And I pray this morning, Father, as we worship you here in this place, Father, that you wouldn't just hear uh, prayers uh, that, are, that, are, that are contrived by this world, but God, you would hear heartfelt prayers, Father, that adore you because you are a hallowed, holy God, deserving of all of our honor and all of our praise this morning. As we confess to you this morning and to the world, Father, that your love will never fail. We love you, and we praise you, and we thank you for your amazing grace. In your name we pray. Amen. I give you my life. I give you my trust. Jesus and you are my God and you are enough Jesus sing that again this morning I give you my life I give you my trust Jesus and you are my God and you are enough Jesus oh Jesus my heart and my heart is yours my heart is yours Take it all, take it all, my life. <laughs> and my heart is yours, my heart is yours. And take it all, take it all, my life in your hands. I give you my life. I take up my cross and Jesus For you are my God Whatever the cost Jesus And oh
my heart is yours Take it all, take it all My life in your hands My heart and my heart is yours My heart is yours Take it all Father, our heart is yours, Lord, our heart is yours. Thank you for everything that you've given us, Lord, in our lives, Lord, and thank you for everything you've done in our lives. Lord, I just pray this, uh, we continue this morning, Lord, I just pray that you speak through Pastor Mark as he preaches your word and gospel this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Because of the peace and fellowship we have with Christ, we also have that with other believers, so go ahead and turn to your neighbor and greet one another. Children are also dismissed for Children's Church. Good morning, Journey. How's everybody doing? Good? Man, I'm excited that you're here with us this morning um, and uh, on this cold uh, Sunday morning in the middle of, I don't know if you watch football, but maybe in the middle of your football watching, but you took time to come and honor God and be here together with the body of Christ. And so we love to come together uh, as a church. And there's, there's several things I think we miss sometimes when we gather together. Sometimes we think it's just about the singing or just about the preaching um, and all those are aspects of our worship but I think the larger part of the reason we come together is to encourage each other and so I love to hear you talking with each other I love to hear the encouraging words and there should also be a place that, that we bring our brokenness you know when we're struggling I find so much of the time that that those um, even because I grew up in church that, that when people are struggling the most is when they pull away from the church and that should be the time we dig deeper right and we need to be with the body of Christ so we're we have entered a month of prayer at the journey we started the new year with prayer I uh, thought that was a great way uh, to kick off this new year but we also started asking the question what is prayer why do we pray what's it all about and so there are a couple of things we're gonna be doing here at the journey leading up to the last Sunday of January which will be our 10th anniversary as a church in existence uh, we started at Haynes Elementary School just down the road and uh, and uh, eventually about uh, six seven years ago we moved on to this property and so we're excited about celebrating that but we wanted to start off uh, the year with talking about prayer then how we can be in prayer for what God has planned next 
So it's kind of like, okay, what next, Lord? We've been here 10 years, probably replanted the church three or four times in the military community, send people come and go, right? But what's next? And so I want you to, there's, in, in the seat back in front of you is a card. It just says, celebrate with us the 10th anniversary. And it says, church-wide luncheon on the grounds, okay? So this is going to be taking place um, that Sunday, uh, the 30th, invite you to come, bring your family, come hang out with us after church. We're going to have a meal together. But on the back of it, it says, I commit to pray the following for the journey in 2022. I had to make sure I got the date right. Okay. I, I read that 2020. I'm going, what? Uh, 2022. So what we're going to do in that service, we're going to have a, a certain time that we're going to come and just lay these at the altar, right, to God and say, we're, we're committing, we're going to pray for the journey this year, okay? And when I mean the journey, uh, don't mean the building, right? And, and, and we know that the people make up the church, but we're, we're talking about the ministry, right? What does God have planned for us next? And so we would love you to be praying for it. So I would just uh, ask you, you know, think of two or three things, or maybe there's just one thing, overall thing. I'm going to pray this for the journey. I'm going to pray that God just uh, uh, reaches the loss for Christ, that we baptize more people in 2022 than we did in 21, right? Whatever that is, and then we're going to have a certain time in that service we're going to bring it forward. The reason I'm telling you about this now is I'd love you to take one of these home, just be praying about it, right? Stick in your Bible or your nightstand somewhere, you'd be thinking about it, and then bring it back that day. We'll have extras if you forget. It, and we're going to have a, a time in the service where we're going to dedicate those uh, to the Lord. All right. So this morning, we are entering into a discussion on confession. Last week, we talked about adoration, right? Confession is one of those things I think many times is maybe confused, right? We, we don't understand what is confession. You know, do we, do we go confess to the priest? You know, do we confess to each other? You know, how does confession work in, in our real lives? Uh, I don't know if you've ever, well, I know you have because everybody has, but if you're driving down the road late at night or, or you've had a long day and you kind of doze off, what are those things you hit on the side of the road? The rumble strips, right? Anybody ever hit those, right? Wakes your kids up, wakes your wife up. I know for me, it wakes my wife up, and I get a big slap in the chest. You'll wake <laughs> up, dummy, right? And, 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 and so she, oh, gosh. It, I'm glad they put those there, but they almost caused me to have a wreck because I hit them, and then I overcorrect, right? Uh, so, but they're there for a reason. Why? Well, they put them there to wake you up, right? You, hey, dummy, you're going off the road. Well, I think confession, and we're going to talk about what confession is, I think it's one of those things that wakes us up, right? When we're confessing that we believe that we need to be forgiven for our sins and we understand we're sinners, right? That wakes us up. And confession isn't a one and done thing. I think that's the other misconception. Is we just pray, receive Christ, and we're done, right? We're good. Right? Confession is a daily coming before God. So we're jolted awake by the knowledge of our sin. That's, that's, what, that's what confession does. It jolts us away. We say, we're sinners. Man, God, we need your grace. So uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, I hope you do. Let's open to Psalm 51, okay? And if you don't have a Bible, by the way, there's always some on the back table. Please take one of those. And, and if you don't have a Bible, just take that with you. We want that to be our gift to you this morning. But if you want to pull that up this morning. So we're going to be looking at Psalm 51. Uh, and let me give you a little background before we read this. This is David talking. Okay, there, there are, are seven, they call them penitential uh, psalms that David prays in scripture, right, of repentance. There's seven different specific psalms, and this to me I think is one of the most heartfelt, most telling. So if you know anything about David's story, Nathan the prophet comes and confronts David with his sin, right, with his sin. And, and, and you know David, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He tried to cover it up by having her husband sent to the front lines and killed. And, and then thus he has an illegitimate child now with this woman. And, and so all of these things. And, and David, by the way, I remind you, he's a man after God's own heart, right? He was God's chosen, right? He's the one that he set apart. And he did all of these things. So Nathan attempted to expose uh, David's sin. And he kind of does it in a, in a little bit of an underhanded way. So he tells the story of a rich and a poor man, right? It says a rich man, you know, um, had lots of flocks and herds. 
tons of, 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 of resources, right? And the poor man only had one poor little you, poor little lamb, right? And, and so in the story, Nathan says, now there were some travelers coming to visit the rich man. And so the rich man didn't want to sacrifice one of his own flock. So he went and he took the one lamb that this poor man had and he butchered it for his friends. Now David's initial reaction was, who is this man? He needs to be held accountable. I mean, God forbid that anybody would do that. And so he's outraged, right? Well, little did David know that Nathan was talking about him. He said he had done that very thing with taking Bathsheba as himself, with being selfish, right? And so David's response to Nathan upon realizing what he had done, he said, I have sinned, right? That was the very first thing out of his mouth. Now let's read Psalm 51, 1 through 17. And then he goes to pray to God, and this is what he prays. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my tr transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, and you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words, and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God. O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Now, I'm going to come down. We're going to start a little bit backwards and go up. I'm going to come down to the very end of this. It says that the Lord is pleased, Right? The sacrifice that he'll accept, okay, is a broken heart, a broken and a contrite heart, right? Is brokenness before God. See, it may initially appear that maybe God is kind of going to let David off the hook, which is not the case at all. In fact, he doesn't just sweep it under the carpet, does he? If you read the story a little bit further, what happens to David? He loses his son. Even after he throws himself on the mercy of God, God chooses to take his son from him, right? Now, now it seems horrible, but the, the consequences there are this illegitimate child he loses, okay? And, and then it, it just kind of goes down from there. Okay, so David was supposed to be the one that was going to build the temple and reestablish the glory of God in Jerusalem. So God took that away from him. He gave it to his son Solomon. He wouldn't let him do that. There were lots of consequences for David's sin. And so I want you to understand, first off, David takes responsibility, right? He doesn't sweep it under the rug. He doesn't discount what he had done. In fact, in the wake of, of numerous confessions today, I think sometimes the attitude of confession has fallen short, right? Because so many people make public what they would say is confessions, right? Of whether it's fallen politicians or sports figures or businessmen or executives, daily somebody's apologizing for something, are they not? They're saying, we're sorry we did that. We didn't mean to do that. My bad. And so they're going into this act of apology. Well, the thing that we have to understand, this is our big idea today, is that forgiven people are committed to being changed by God, right? They're committed to changing their action. They're con committed to going a different way. Those are truly committed to God. And when looking at confession, we learn three important elements. And the very first one David gives us, we must admit our sins, right? And so David said to Nathan, I have sinned against who? The Lord. I've sinned against God, 
right? And so the holiness of God is going to begin to shape your attitude in prayer. It begins to shape your heart. It begins to shape your life, right? And so the first thing that, that David understands is the seriousness of it, right? The seriousness of what he's done. So the Lord shapes our heart through confession, right? And then he teaches us the seriousness of a sin. Notice David, let me give you the words. These are the words David uses to describe his sin. He calls them transgressions, right? We don't, we don't use that in our language today, but a transgression refers to rebellion. It's a deliberate crossing over the line. It's, it's like if I deliberately did something against you, right? I, I deliberately want something bad to happen to you, so I do you harm. That's a transgression. He says, my iniquities. So he suggests the perverseness and twistedness. I mean, you got to think about this. This is a twisted, devious thing to do, Right? Because David sees Bathsheba, and she's bathing on a rooftop, and he knows he is the king, and he has authority over her, so he could take her for his own, right? There's nothing in Scripture that says she willingly came. By force, he took this woman into his chamber. So that is an iniquity before God. And then he says, I sin. It's, it's falling short of the mark. And then the last one in verse 4, he says it was evil. He refers to the ugliness and the repulsiveness of sin. See, repentance is not motivated by a desire to escape consequences. That's not what confession is. It doesn't mean we come to God and we, we say, hey, if I confess to God, then he's going to take all, care of all of the consequences, right? I don't know if that worked out for you. It never worked out for me. I still face consequences today of things that I did years and years and years ago. See, Jesus once for all paid the price, yes, of sin, right? So we can be forgiven. But that doesn't negate the consequences of my sin. However, because of his holiness, right, and because of his love for us, he gives us a way to be made whole again. So Diedrich Bonhoeffer talks about cheap grace. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, if you don't know who he is, uh, he came out of World War II uh, during the period when Jews and Christians alike were being persecuted. Uh, he actually wound up in a concentration camp for a while, got out of that, uh, and eventually ended up in the United States. And he talked about cheap grace. And this is what he said. He said, when we fail to see the seriousness of our sin, we cheapen the grace of God. We fail to see the seriousness of our sin. We cheapen the grace of God. See, if we teach forgiveness and fail to require repentance and confession, we cheapen the freedom we've been given. See, costly grace is this. It's a treasure, he says, that's hidden in a field, and for the sake of it, a man will sell all he has and do whatever he can to obtain that. That's how precious grace is. He says it's a pearl of great price to buy which a merchant would sell all of his goods. He would give away all he had today just to possess it. See, it's the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake man will pluck out his own eye to keep from sinning again. Wow, that's confession? All that is wrapped up in confession. It's costly, the grace of God. After all, it condemns sin right? But for the sinner, above all, it is costly because it costs God his son. It costs Jesus Christ to buy it. So we understand the, the price that was paid, but we also understand the essence of it. I think we have to understand there is an there is a essence of sin. So David turns to his hope, right? So his hope is in Christ Jesus alone, right? His hope that God is the only one that can secure his future. The one he has sinned against is God. Here's where David comes, right? He didn't go to somebody else. He didn't go to a guru. He didn't go to a self-help group. He doesn't go to, to Dear Abby or whatever you listen to, your horoscope to find out what should I do with my future, right? He goes to God. He says, God, you are the only one who can help me. See, it's nothing less than saying we wish, sometimes if we, if we go other places, we're saying, I wish that there was another way. I wish there was another way. I wish, I wish there was another way that I could be made clean. See, while it is true that David's sin against Bathsheba also affected Uriah, her husband, he lost his life. It affected the nation of Israel. Okay, sent them on a spiral, right? It, it affected a lot of people. But if we don't start with God first, see, I think this is the problem with sin. We, when we sin, we don't see, see that as an offense to God. 
We don't see we're offending God. See, sin is a very affront to the holiness of God. Possibly, we do not take sin seriously because we fail to see that it is directly related to our relationship with God. Notice in 2 Samuel 2, 12, 13, David's first response was, I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. His immediate reaction is, I've sinned against the Lord. Oh my, I better go pray. I better get before God. I better, I better seek God's face, right? And then he understands the origin of it. Look at, look at verse 5. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So what is the whole idea of original sin? How does, that, how does that work into our theology and our understanding of God? Well, David goes back to the origin of his sin, right? It started in the Garden of Eden with the very first sin, right? Well, what was the very first sin against God? It was a sin of omission, okay? Now, now you have sins of contrition and sins of omission. Let me, let me differentiate these. So a sin of omission is knowing the right thing to do, but choosing not to do that anyway, right? There are sins of contrition. You may be a new believer. Maybe you don't know that that is against God and that's an affront to God. And once you're told that and you're given that knowledge, you're like, I don't want to do that, right? But most people in Christian circles follow a sin of omission. I know God would not be pleased if I did this, but I'd do it anyway. That's what David did. He just ignored God and went and did his own thing. So David goes back to the original of the sin. The sin that David committed was not a freakish uh, freak accident, right? I mean, it's not like Bathsheba just accidentally fell into his bed, you know? I mean, he made a sin of omission. He chose to willfully go do that. And the other thing we understand is it's not abnormal to humankind. It wasn't if David was going to sin. It's when he sinned, right? So David, because of his sin nature. So when we're born, look what he says. He says that when I was born, he said, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. I was brought, brought forth into a sin nature. In fact, look what Isaiah said in Isaiah 6, 5. He said, and I said, woe is me, for I I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This was, this was Isaiah's reaction to coming before a holy God. It's like, whoa. When's the last time we did that? We just said, whoa, it's me, Lord. Man, I am a sinner. See, the very element of David's life from conception was tainted with sin, Right? And without God, without going to Him first, without daily confessing our sins to God, we wind up in the same state. Well, the second thing we learn is we must own our sins. Not only must we recognize what sin is, but we must own our sin. See, we honor God when we accept His verdict. See, by accepting His sin, David agreed with God about it. But before his confession, he was in a state of dispute, right? He was in a state of denial. I, my thought is, I kind of wonder, why did it take Nathan coming to him to point his sin out to him? Have you ever had your sins pointed out to you before? Oh, yeah, I have, right? Is that an easy pill to take? No. I mean, most of us are like, who are you, ta- you talking about, me? <laughs> Surely not me. I, di- I didn't commit that sin, right? And so we usually kind of dismiss it away. And so initially, when his sin was brought to him, he didn't see it, right, for what it was. We live in a world and a culture, I, I believe, that doesn't want to take responsibility for anything today, right? Nobody takes responsibility for their actions. We're good at passing the buck, right? It's always somebody else's fault, right? Man, I was a, um, I know you'll probably think less of me when I say this, but I was, I was a conniving kid right? I was one of those that could always pass the buck off to somebody else. Then I was a talker, so I could usually talk myself circles around the truth, right? And so I get brought in the principal's office or whatever. I, I was good at talking. And I don't know why people just believe me and they bought into it, but somehow, sometimes we want to pass it off to somebody else. We say, hey, this is their fault. It's not my fault. I didn't do that. And so then we try to condone our sins, do we not? See, see the adage, the devil made me do it, right, flies in the face of a holy God. 
That doesn't, that doesn't work with God. Or, or do we genuinely believe that he desires good for his children? I think sometimes we think God's just like the big killjoy in the sky. Kill my fun, sir. I don't want you to enjoy your life. See, we suspect sometimes that God's best plan for my marriage, for my family, for my job is not the right plan. So what do we do? We go choose our own plan. Look what he says in verse 6 of Psalm 51. He says, Behold, you delight in the truth, in the inward being. I don't know if you know this about God. He will always get at the truth of your heart. He'll always get at the truth of your heart. You can't lie to God. I can't escape God. He delights, but, but the truth is in our inward being. So, so this is the opposite of the world. What does the world do? They want to get fixed from the outside in, right? We, we just want a quick fix, right? If I go in, I confess my sin to the priest, or I confess my sin to somebody else, or I do this, I want the external fixing, or I go say enough Hail Marys, or go do enough of this, I'll be okay. You know where God changes you? From the inside out, right? It says we're transformed in, in Romans 12, too, by the renewing of our minds. So it starts on the inside. And so this is the third one. We must plead God's mercy over our sins. What does, that, what does that mean? We must plead God's mercy. Well, renewal takes place at the mercy seat of God. That's where our lives start to change. We've talked about this before, just to give you a little history on Israel. So they would carry around this Ark of the Covenant, right? And in this cacophus was you, you had you had the staff of Moses, you had some of the unleavened bread, you had the Ten Commandments, and, and so all of these were inside right of this and they were carried around it was holy in fact if you even touched it and you would die and and in the middle of this was a place that was called the mercy seat and, and on either side of this were, were two cherubim with their eyes covered right facing inward towards that mercy seat and once a year in Yom Kippur the day of atonement what would happen the high priest would come in and would slaughter the animal, he would, he would spread the blood on the mercy seat, right? So, so basically what's happening there is he's saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, for we are all sinners in need of your mercy. We're sinners in need of being renewed. And the thing is, they would do that day after day after day. Well, this is what happens in our Christian walk is we become followers of Christ. We say, I'm going to confess your Savior, Lord. I love you. I want to go to heaven. I want everything you have to offer. But that is the last time we go before the throne of God and confess our sins. We're like, I don't need to do that anymore. How often do we throw ourselves on that mercy seat of God? Remember that forgiven people are committed to being changed by God. And it's a process in our lives. See, David pours out his heart to be changed he says, I want to be changed. He does this in six ways. Remember, the forgiving people are committed to being changed, right? That includes the adulterer, the cheater, the liar, the worst of the worst, the child molester. All have to have a, a desire to be changed from the inside out. So David pours his heart out. The first one is he prays for God to confirm his salvation. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, he says, cast me not away from your presence and take don't take your spirit away from me. Now, some of those would say, who are the elect, the chosen of God, would say, maybe this applies to we can lose our salvation, right? Because David's saying, hey, cast me not away, Lord. Don't cast me away from your presence. But literally what David's doing is he's saying, Lord, don't count me with the un unbelievers. Don't count me with the Gentiles. Don't count me as someone who doesn't know you. It, we read in Hebrews 6, when we went through Hebrews 6, remember? In Hebrews 6, he says, there are those who have tasted. They've seen that you're good, O Lord, and they choose to do sin anyway, Right? And, and he says, they've fallen away from you. And so what we would say is they weren't truly believers to begin with, right? Because I believe if you truly know God, if you truly know his son, if you truly taste it, you've truly seen him, right? Then there's no way that you, could, that you could walk away from that. See, true children of God long to be forgiven. Let me say that again. True children of God long to be forgiven. So what happens when we sin? We feel restlessness in our heart and our soul and our spirit, and we're convicted. And man, I can't sleep. I can't eat. I can't do anything until I make things right with God because I'm convicted of my sin. Now, I do believe that Christians can grow a callous heart. 
right? There are times that we've sinned to the point that we become calloused our sin. But I believe that for the believer in their life, they are marked by forgiveness. Number two, he prays for a new heart. Look in, look in verse 10. He says, David wants to be, be finished with that kind of life. He says, he says, I need a changed heart. Create in me today, Lord, a changed heart. Maybe that should be your prayer every day. Lord, create in me a clean heart. Give me, give me a right spirit in you. We read in Ezekiel 33, 26 and Hebrews 8, 10, that God takes a stony heart and he turns it to a heart of flesh, right? Remember with Nicodemus, he said, he said, you must be born again before you can come to me. So he has to change our heart, right? He has to change your heart before you can come to God. In fact, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this. He calls the idea of a heart of flesh a peculiar feature of religion. Other religions like Pharisees begin with the outward appearance, right? That's what we're talking about, from the outside in. He says, no truth is more sure than when Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again first. Spurgeon declares that true religion begins with the heart. And the heart is the ruling power of your life. You may enlighten a man's understanding. Now, to get this, and he's known much. But he says, still, as long as his heart is hardened, it's a heart of stone. He doesn't have a heart of flesh. And he, and he goes on to say, he knows good to be good, but he refers to evil. He sees the light, but he loves the darkness more than he loves the light. This is what, this is what Paul is talking about at the beginning of Romans, right? Man loved darkness more than he loved light. And then he began to what? He began to worship the created thing instead of the creator God. I love the things out there more than I love you, God, right? Indeed, he says, we are in desperate need of a changed heart. The third thing is he prays for the joy and gladness to return. He says, I want the joy and gladness of the Lord to return. Have you ever struggled finding joy in life? I have. I think we all have it sometime, right? Maybe we see so much going on in the world, so many things out there, we struggle just finding joy. Where's the joy in my life? And this is what David says, I want joy to return to my heart. So I would say that David probably had already been struggling with this before Nathan ever came to him. He had lost that joy, and he knew what he was doing was wrong. See, there is no joy and gladness to be found in the throes of rebellion and sin. We don't find joy there. You can imagine a man after God's own heart, especially David, day after day being reminded of his sin. Be reminded that he walked away from God. See, David speaking for God does not see things that way. So, so the, one of the things I, I think is interesting in this whole prayer, he doesn't mention the sexual sin at all. Do you notice that? He doesn't mention sex. doesn't mention the symptoms. Uh, he doesn't mention anything about the act that caused all of this to take place. Why? Well, I believe it's because David knows the symptoms of sin. He knows the symptoms of the disease. Why isn't he praying maybe for sexual restraint or more men to hold him accountable? Why isn't he praying for protection from his eyes and thoughts? Well, the reason is that he knows that sex is only the symptom of the issue. See, people fall into sin, all kinds of sin, because they don't have the fullness of the joy of Christ in their life every day. They're struggling to find that joy. Therefore, they're looking, what, for something else to fill that void. If I can find something else to fill that void, something else to give me joy, right? And so we replace the thing that God needed to be in with all these other things in our lives. The fourth thing is we learn he prays that God would bring his joy to an overflowing praise. Man, I love this. God, bring my joy just to overflow in worship of you. Verse 15 says, O Lord, open my lips and mouth to declare your praise. David's asked God to remove the barrier that has dulled his heart, right? Church, I'm going to be honest with you this morning. Some of us need to go before the throne of God and ask him to remove that barrier that is hindering our worship of him, hindering our prayer, right? I guarantee you the times you go before the throne of God in prayer, if you're struggling with prayer, it's not God. <laughs> it's not what God's doing because he never left. He's always there. 
I tell you, nine times out of ten in my experience, it's because we put a barrier between us and God. There's some unconfessed sin. There's something in our life that we're struggling with, and we're not taking it before the throne of God. Many of us carry this weight like an albatross around in our life all day long, all these unconfessed sins. And we're like, why am I struggling here? God, why are you not hearing me here? Why are you not answering my prayer here? And maybe the problem is we're not going daily before the throne of God and confessing to him that I'm a sinner. And, and I'll tell you a very appropriate prayer, and I've prayed this many times. Lord, I, please show my sin to me. I may, I may not know where I've sinned today, but I know I'm a sinner. I know I need your forgiveness. See, the last time we truly got on our knees, what did we do? Did we ask for God's mercy? Look at Philippians 2.12. So Paul writes to the church at Philippi, he says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. And, and I want you to get this. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, right? And this is where I said, this doesn't mean we're getting saved over and over again, okay? That's not what that means, okay? And, and, and so some of us, you know, wonder, well, what is that? how do I work out my salvation? I prayed a prayer. I received God's grace and mercy into my life. So, so how does that work? This is what's happening in your life. This is the renewal process. What does it mean to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Well, even though we know that we are saved by grace and through faith alone, Paul reminds us that what we do is a strong indicator of what we believe about our salvation. Is it being worked out in your life? And the key word is what? Work out, right? Man, it happened again. 2022. First time I got to go to the Y, I couldn't find a parking place. Before 2022, there were tons of parking places at the gym. Why? Because people don't stick with workout programs, but it's, it always happens, right? 2022, got to get in shape, going to the gym. Irritates people like me that go all the time. No, I don't go all the time, but try to be a regular, right? But what, what does it take to get in shape? Any workout or exercise person to say consistency, right? You have to be consistent. If you're not consistent, it's with anything else, right? They say it takes 40 days to start a new habit. Try it, right? That's why people don't stay on diets. They don't exercise. Because 40 days, you think that's a short time? That's a long time to consistently do something. That's what it takes to learn the, the Word of God. I believe that learning Scripture, we need to do that for 40 days before it sticks, right? All of these things are about consistency in our life. The fifth thing is he prays that the result of effective would be effective evangelism. I love this. Verse 13. Don't miss this. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Have you ever considered that maybe you're going through or have been through certain things in your life so that somebody else can come to know Christ? I have. I've seen that to be true. How often does God use sinful lives of a wayward person who's come back to him to show his grace and mercy? We've had uh, baptisms up here, and we're going to have one on the 30th again. Uh, so I'll be talking about that in a little bit. But um, at our baptisms, we always have people write out their testimonies, right? We read those. And I remember not too long ago, we had, had a baptism, and someone had, had written out the life they had come from, right? All the struggles they had had. And no sooner than the service get over, and somebody made a beeline down, and they said, I need to talk to him, because that's my life. I mean, that's where I'm at, Right? And so what, what David's saying is, I pray that what has happened to me, right, might, might help somebody else who's gone astray. Consider this, David, David has a, a twofold confidence in prayer. He knew that God would use his experience, right, to pull other people out of the depth of their sin, but he also knew that God would not fail to hear him when he prayed to him. He knew that God was faithful. See, the sacrifices of God or a broken spirit, he says, and a contrite heart. He will not despise the faithful heart, and he won't despise the faithful prayer. Look what it says in James 5, 16. James writes, therefore confess your sins, and I think this is important about confession, to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So this is another aspect of prayer. When I share Christ and share my story, my testimony, what am I doing? I'm confessing 
to someone, this is who I was, and this is where I'm going, and this is where I am now, right? And so we're confessing that. That's healthy. We need to do that. We need to go before other people. And I go, I have friends I go to all the time. First, I go to God because I know he's the only one that can forgive me and can wipe me clean. But I need to go to somebody else. I need to confess that. I need to say that's why it's healthy. That's why we do that at baptism. We want people to write out their testimony. And the first thing, when somebody gets saved, I say, go share that testimony with somebody. Somebody needs to hear that. See, confessing our sins to one another brings healing, I believe, into our lives. It's the effectual genuineness of a contrite heart. And then the last one is he prays for brokenness. Look in verse 8. He says, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Has anybody ever broken a bone before? I must just, I must have tough tough bones somehow i have no idea because i've fallen from the top of this roof down on my flat feet hit a table on the way down trust me i knocked i I tried to break everything in my body and and my son comes picks me up off the floor so sad you know my ankle swells up and and we go to the hospital and the first thing the 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 er doctor looked at he said that's got to be shattered didn't break a bone right i felt like i did But I've heard from people who have broken a bone say there's nothing like it. You'll know it, right? And apparently I didn't. But they said it's very painful. I want you to know the restoration process is not easy. The renewal process in Christ can be painful, right? It's a painful process. I've always believed this. I believe anything worthwhile takes some pain, right? And struggles. And and, and the reality is he says let the bones. This is what David prays that you have broken now rejoice right what does it mean to be brokenhearted did you know you can be brokenhearted with joy (laughs) i can be brokenhearted in my sin but i can rejoice in god because he saved me right i want you to be careful not to suppose that you get past having a broken and contrite heart some people think the only time they're going to be broken is when they come to christ the first time that's not true I think we are constantly reminded of our sin nature. We need to come with mourning, right, and confess our sin. In fact, Jonathan Edwards said this. He said, a gracious affection, feelings, emotions that are sweet to Christ are broken-hearted affection. A truly Christian love, either to God or men, is a humble, broken-hearted love. The desires of the saints, however, earnest or humble desires, their hope is a humble hope. And their joy, even when it is unspeakable, is full of glory because they have a humble and broken heart before God. I don't know if you've ever, um, the, the TV networks are full of shows and things you have before and after pictures, right? People love that. Why? Because people love the transformation story. They love to see something just completely transformed, right? Something old turned new right? And, and so um, one of my wife's and my favorite shows is uh, Fixer Upper. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Um, uh, so the gains, I, I have a slight connection with them uh, through some friends, but um, I, I love watching the show. What do I love best? Well, I love, and I've got a picture here, I think, of a house. And so I love that they take something that looks like you wouldn't put a homeless person in, right? And they make it look like that. I never get that, right? No matter how much money they have to spend to do that, right? But they always go in and they take something that's completely broken down. But one of the things I notice about this story, the, their show is inevitably something goes wrong, right? I don't know if they plan it that way. But they get halfway through the villa. Oh, we found termites or we found this. I'm going, you check that out to begin with. But they eventually get to the end project, right? And sometimes they have to call the homeowners back and say, hey, it's going to be 10000 extra dollars. Well, just pay it. Go ahead. You know, I'm going, great. <laughs> I would have been like, I'm sunk. But somehow, at the end of the story, what do they do? They have a renewed project, right? Well, see, for us, our life is in a perpetual state of being renewed, right? Every day. The Bible says that. From one degree of glory to the other. From one degree of I know I'm a sinner. Now, it doesn't mean we don't sin, 
But I can tell you this, the more you're renewed, the more you become like Christ, okay, those sins may not become as much of a crisis in your life. And so you have to continually go before God and confess Him and remind yourself that you're not perfect. You haven't reached that yet, right? He is in the process of making you new. In fact, in Revelation 21, it says, Behold, I'm making all things new. Include you, all of his creation. Read in Romans 8 how all of creation is waiting with eager anticipation. Our spirit groans within us. Why? Because we know that we are not in the place he wants us to be at. So I want you to ask yourself two questions uh, this morning before we close. What do the before and after pictures look like in your life? What do they look like? Do you ever go back and consider what your life was, right, compared to what it is today? I think that's healthy. I think that sometimes remembering where God's taken us from, right? The journey, no pun intended, right? Because we're going along that path. How do we get there? And then the second question I think is healthy for us to ask is how is our life daily un- undergoing a renovation, right? Are we daily allowing the Spirit to chip away at our life? I used to love... Um, when I was a student pastor, we went to lots of conferences, and the skit guys used to do a great, great skit. I've done it with youth, but you have, have one individual standing up here and a guy playing God with a chisel in his hand, right? And the, and the, the student standing there feeling like, I'm good, I've got Jesus, my life is great, and everything, and then he begins to chip away. He takes a little bit of pride out of their life, a little bit of dishonesty here, you know, a little bit of that, you know, and the student's like, oh, man, that hurts. <laughs> Lord, don't, 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 don't treat me like that. And then God finally just kind of steps back and he's like, do you really want to be made new? If you do, you need the master chiseler to take some chisels to your life. And I believe that happens when we go before the throne of God and we confess daily. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you that you are daily changing us and making us new. Father, you are daily working, and the Spirit's daily working in our lives. And Father, I pray that we would, if we are comfortable in a place maybe this morning where we feel like we've arrived, that we would, we would go before your throne and confess that, even that, that prideful hypocrisy, Father, that we have not arrived. You are daily working on our hearts and our lives. No matter how good and righteous and perfect we think we are father we know that the most righteous deeds here on this earth are but filthy rags before your throne so father i pray you clean us and make us new and i i pray if there's one here this morning just struggling with lots of sin and things in their life father that today they would go confess that to you realize that true healing and true restoration only take place at the throne and the mercy seat of god and that you'll give them a heart of flesh Father, you'll take that stony heart and you'll begin to chisel it away so they see you and they see themselves, Father. Father, we are so thankful that we don't have a God or existence today where we have to live in sin and death, that we can be made new and that you bring freedom into our lives every day. We love you, God. We praise you. Pray all these things in your most amazing name because you are God and we are not. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So I don't know where you're at this morning um, on the idea of confession. I would just get you to, I would just ask you to ask this morning, when's the last time you really did confess to God? You went before his throne, realized that you need to be renewed today. It's a daily process and we're all there working on it. And so maybe this week, maybe even as early as today, this afternoon, you need to just get before the throne of God and just confess your sins to God. Say, I need you. I need your healing in my life. Please come in and make me new today. And maybe you're here this morning, and part of the problem, the reason that, that, that you, don't, you don't get confession and, and that you're struggling with this over and over again, maybe you still have that stony heart. Maybe you don't truly know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you haven't prayed the all most important confessing prayer, which takes place when you become a believer. You say, Jesus, I am a sinner and I need you in my life. And the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll come in and he'll make you into a new being. He'll take your heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh. If that's you this morning, I would just invite you to confess that to him today. 
Sometimes we think we have to wait till we have all the right words together, or even we have our life together before we come before the throne of God. The Bible says even the most righteous deed that you can ever think of doing is filthy rags before the throne of God, right? He takes you as you are, and he changes you from the inside out. I'm going to be available after church. I'd love to talk with you, or let's get together this week, and let's have coffee, and let's just pray about it. And let's begin to see how God is going to change your life. We're going to take part in the Lord's Supper this morning. It's been taken for over 2,000 years in the church. This is the greatest picture of our confession. This is a form of confession to the world that we are believers. And so if you're a follower of Christ, you confess him as Lord and Savior, we invite you to take this meal with us. We're going to bring the elements to our seat, and we're going to take it together. There's a table at the front in the alcove and, and one up here by the stage. I would invite you, would you come to the table this morning? Let's stand. Let's come and commune together. this morning a part of I believe one of the greatest restoration projects the world has ever known the most beautiful restoration project the world has ever known because he is creating you into his a perfect likeness and he's going to continue to do that in fact Paul says that in Philippians 1 6 that he who began a good work in you is going to bring it to completion and we can trust that and so we profess this morning that we are sinners in need of his grace and give a very visible picture to his disciples on the night before he is to be betrayed and to be murdered and crucified on a cross. And he took the bread that night. He blessed it and he passed it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Let's eat, church, the body of Christ. Greater love hath no man than this than they would lay down his life for someone else. I can't conceive of, I can't even imagine what it must have took for God to send his only son to die for me. And I struggle with the idea of that part of grace every day. But I'm so glad he did. As Jesus gave the cup. He reminded them that this is the cup of the new covenant that he promised. Remember, God never breaks his promises. He's always faithful and true. And he says, in this cup is a representation of my blood that's given for you. Let's drink, church, the blood of Christ. So I want to challenge you just this week, wherever you're at on the edge of confession, begin going before the throne of God and see if he won't change your life and your heart. Let's go ahead and stand as we worship this morning.
Let's sing it out. And oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, and strong defender of my weary heart, my sword to fight the cruel deceiver, and my shield against the faithful dark. And my soul, when enemies surround me, and my hope, when tides of sorrow rise, my joy, when trials are abounding, your faithfulness, my refuge in the so thankful and grateful uh, that you chose to come worship with us here this morning uh, and be with us from wherever you came. We're just glad you're here. We'd invite you uh, to fill out a connect card. We just love to share some more about the church and about the journey. There are connect cards in the seat back in front of you. We also have some on the back table, welcome table, and we'll have some folks back there who love to share with you more about the journey. Uh, but we just love to send uh, some information about our church this week. So we invite you to fill that out. There's also there's a little wicker basket. You can just leave it there or leave it in your seat, and we'll get it uh, after we complete today. Uh, um, so tonight, youth, don't forget, we have youth at 6 o'clock. We are studying the book of Psalms, and so uh, we're excited about meeting with you and hanging out and doing that uh, as well. We have coming up uh, the 30th on uh, our uh, celebration. We want to have baptism. So maybe you're here. Um, let me tell you who baptism is for. Baptism is for those who have professed Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior, no matter how long ago it was or how recent it was, right? And so we would love to baptize you. The Bible says we should all do that, right, in accordance with obedience to Him, right? And so we are going to take part in Believer's Baptism. If you'd like to be a part of that service, we have a sign-up on the back. Uh, you can also go to our website and find information on that, and, uh, and I'll just get in touch with you, and we'll talk about how that's going to take uh, place on that Sunday as well. We also have our next Discover the Journey class. This is our, our membership class. We have this on the first Saturday of every month, and so we'd invite you to come in February and uh, be a part of that. If you've been coming for a while or just would like more information about the church, it's a great time to get that. Uh, we also have a sign up on the back table for that. And the very last thing, I'll, I've been forgetting to remind you and announce this. So we're um, ordering just some 
just some yard signs that uh, say join us at the journey and they have uh, in fact that's exactly what they look like right have our service times and so um, anyway it's just another way to begin to share with people about the church and so um, I don't you may be in a situation your homeowner association or something you can't put yard signs out and I understand that but if you would like one of these uh, they're $15 uh, we're getting a pretty good deal on them and so we're going to use these just again sharing with people about the church so if you would like one of those uh, you can there's also a sign up on the back table uh, to put your name down and we'll order you one of those as well all right well let me have you stand this morning and let me pray for us uh, as we head on out father God I'm so thankful father that you made a way through your son Jesus Christ that we could come and confess to you and father how we would fail so miserably every week if we would just not even take advantage of what you've given us through your son Jesus Christ what a great privilege it is to come before the throne of God and we know that the faithful heart you will never cast away thank you for hearing us when we pray to you O oh Lord I pray now you'll take our message you'll take our testimonies the words of our mouth and the testimony of our feet God into a world that desperately needs to know you we pray all this because you're God and we are not in your son's most holy name we pray amen God bless. Y'all have a great week.